In the name of the one living God, creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I have some relatives in Stanton. Most of you know where Stanton is. It's about 30 minutes from here. And I visit them once every few years, and I stay for about 15 minutes. <laughs> but before you judge me, let me tell you that they're all dead. There's a plot there, and I have childhood memories of a couple of the people who were in it, but most of them were dead before I was born. One of those people... Uh, was a great-grandfather who died in 1947. And in the early part of the 20th century, uh, he had a hunting accident. He was out bird hunting, and the story is that he fell climbing a fence. I always picture this in the woods. It might have been in a field. I really don't know. I don't even know how old he was. I know he lived many years afterwards. But in somehow getting hung on this fence or tripping or falling over the fence, he managed to shoot himself in the leg or the foot, and for the rest of his life, he, he, he had a prosthesis, he used a wooden leg, and uh, my father was quite a young child when his grandfather died, but he, he always had a memory of, uh, he had this little pocket knife, and he would, when he would take this wooden leg off at the end of the day, he would, he would whittle on it to try to make it just a little more comfortable, to try to make the fit better, and my father kept that little knife all his life, and I have it now, so that's a connection that I have with that, with that grave. Most of the people in that plot I don't know much about. In my experience with, with lots of parishioners and more than a few family members, if your foot causes you to stumble, get a cane. Get a walker. Get some strength training. Get some balance therapy. But Jesus says if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. And so the last time I visited those graves, I had these sayings rattling around in my head, and it occurred to me for the first time, here is someone who showed up at the gates of the kingdom having cut off the, food, the, the foot that had caused him to stumble. And I had this sort of fleeting and sort of silly thought, like, does he have his leg back in heaven? Does he have a wooden leg? Does he need his knife back? <clears throat> might be a silly question, but it's one that, that points to a wondering that comes up often enough in Scripture. It comes up, for example, in, in Jesus' story about the woman who married all the brothers serially, and the Pharisees say, so whose wife will she be in heaven? It comes up, even if we don't identify it this way, it comes up often in contemporary culture where families, upon, upon the death of a family member, we'll often have a discussion about what picture will we use for the obituary. Will we use the picture of this person in the full bloom of youth? Will we use a picture uh, from recent years? Who, who's this person going to be in heaven? What part goes? What part gets left behind? To point out, sometimes when we when we reach these points of absurdity, whose wife will she be? How young are you going to be in heaven? It's a good warning that you've pushed the metaphor too far with the language that we use to talk about the kingdom of God. And in fact, we are deeply conflicted. Whether we know it or not, whether we admit it or not, we are just deeply conflicted about what it means to be human to be fully human. And it's a central question, maybe the central question of faith. The central question of faith is not what is the ultimate mystery of the cosmos. The, the point of faith is not to answer every query, but, but primarily to face those two questions that have been cited as the two questions that are really just not subject to scientific investigation. One is, who are we? And two is, how are we to live? What is it to be human? What do we mean by human? These are the questions that are behind the creation stories in Genesis, with the benefit of no scientific investigation whatsoever, 
The writers of those stories were able to look at the world around them and wonder what is it to be human and to notice, wow, being human is a lot like being an animal. And it's totally unlike being an animal. And to think, wow, being human is uncannily like being God. And yet it is absolutely nothing like being God. And we carry both of these impulses in our colloquialisms. In our colloquial language, we say things all the time like, well, I'm only human. I'm only human. I'm flawed, prone to failure and shortcoming, bound to sin. Unlike God, only human. Only human, nothing more. And then, on the other hand, we have this other aspirational idea of what it is to be human when we label these actions and tendencies of humankind that unfathomable mountains of actual evidence show these behaviors to be utterly human, and we describe them as inhuman. Cruelty, oppression, Violence on the scale of individuals and families, violence on the scale of nations and peoples, tribalism, exploitation, sexual violence, dispossession, displacement. We have the evidence that tells us these things are human. And when we find ourselves complicit in them, we say, well, I'm only human. But there's another part of our hearts and minds that describes these things exactly as the opposite, as inhuman. We say that it's inhuman to deprive others, even violent criminals, prisoners of war, of basic necessities, of what we call human dignity. And yet humans deprive one another of those things all the time. So is that human or inhuman? Our colloquial language can't decide, and maybe, I wonder if it's possible that that is because our deepest selves can't decide either. So Jesus says it's better to enter the kingdom maimed than to be cast whole into hell. Now we have lots of scriptural and, and theological uh, wisdom and imagery describing Jesus as fully human. And I don't just mean only human. I mean fully, like a vision of God's perfect future. There are theologians who describe the Christ as coming to us from God's perfected future, from the perfected future of humanity. So not just a perfect human living in historical troubled times among us, not just a perfect human in that way, but a perfected human. Maimed. So when humanity, when the body of Christ approaches the kingdom for entry, we see in, in the manifestation of the body of Christ as Jesus on the cross, we see that person maimed. And as individuals... Should we be so blessed as to approach the kingdom, we will go with our wounds. As families, tribes, languages, nations, and peoples, we go wounded. As the human family, we go with all those flaws, all those shortcomings, all those stubborn sins that cause us to say, well, we're only human. And yet that is the state in which we approach the kingdom for redemption. So the question is what part of ourselves, individually, communally, collectively, as the whole human family, what part of ourselves need to be cut off and cast away to be more fully human? I've already told you most of the details that I know about the lives of the people in those graves <laughs> in Sten. I know more about that one than I know about some of the others, but I know 
that like the whole human family, that family, like a lot of other families, was troubled. They were beset by stumbling blocks of misfortune and stumbling blocks of stubborn sin. As the saying goes, the combination of bad luck and bad decisions. So that last time that I was there contemplating my one-legged great-grandfather in his grave, my thoughts shifted away from that shot up leg which one way or another was surely cast away and shifted to thinking more about what are the other things that would have been should have been needed to have been left behind when those relatives who were after all only human entered the nearer presence of God what about the pettiness the manipulativeness what about the unkindness the marital discord, the mental illness, the alcoholism, the suicidal depression. And I don't think this is so extraordinary. They were only human. I tried to imagine all of those things being amputated and cast away. And I prayed and I pray that for me and for you, for the belligerence in the wars that rage, that rage around us, for the loved ones and the leaders whose flaws break, the, break our hearts. For our own selves whose flaws break the hearts of those who love us. For the whole troubled, dysfunctional human family, I prayed that Jesus might be telling us that all the failures and flaws and shortcomings and sins that make us only human might in the eyes of God be exactly those things that are sometimes revealed to us to be inhuman. And I was interested to learn in this gospel passage that that word that appears again and again, stumble, and it's not just about the foot. It's not only the foot that causes the person to stumble. Your eye can cause you to stumble. Your hand can cause you to stumble. Woe to you who put a stumbling block in front of another. That word stumble, it turns out, is related to a word that also comes to us as scandal. So something that is scandalous to our humanity is what needs to be cast away. I found myself praying that when God, will, God willing in the kingdom by and by, that scandalous inhumanity is exercised, cut off, amputated, and cast away, that what's left, that's what's, what's left of each of us, and of us together, and of the whole troubled, dysfunctional human family, that what is left would be the body of Christ. Holy human, perfectedly human, only human. Amen.